Hello, 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 Sure Babe listeners. Welcome back. This is episode 54, and this is another episode on marriage and relationships. I'm super excited to have a world renowned name in psychology, Mort Fertel, on the show today. He's the creator of Marriage Fitness, and today we're chatting all about seven ways that you can fix your marriage, specifically, his seven secrets for fixing marriage. And I say this with a little like asterisk by it. I don't want you guys to tune off thinking, well, I'm fine. My marriage is fine. You know, like we're not in crisis. You don't have to be in crisis to want to fix parts of your marriage or to make it better. And so I feel like with um, the secrets that Mort shares today, you will definitely have more tools in your toolbox to um, make your relationship better. We only have one life to live and we want to milk you know, whatever we can out of it. And that applies to our relationships. We want to make them the best that they can be. So I feel like this is such a valuable episode and I'm super excited to introduce you guys to Mort. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Well, hello, Sure Babe listeners. Okay, today I have Mort Fertel. He is a leading authority on the psychology of relationships. He has an international reputation for saving marriages. He's the creator of Marriage Fitness, a relationship renewal system that has saved millions of couples from marital crisis. And he is also the author of the book, Marriage Fitness, Four Steps to Building and Maintaining Phenomenal Love. So Mort is here today to share his proven strategies for creating a fulfilling, successful relationship. And we're specifically going to talk about seven secrets for fixing your marriage. He is an authority on this, you guys. He has been on USA Today, been featured in the New York Times, Huffington Post, ABC, NBC, CBS. We're talking everything. So I'm so excited today to have Mort here um, to hopefully encourage some of you guys where you're at in your relationships and give you guys some tips and tricks and tools for your toolbox to start working on your marriage, maybe in a different way than you even expected. So Thank you for being here, Mort. Welcome to the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes. Okay. So my first question is, how did you get into this line of work in saving marriages? Because I am a marriage and family therapist, and one of the the trickiest things is is marriage for us. And how, because you really don't have control over when you get someone into the office. And a lot of times things fester and there's so much hurt and so many wounds when you get a couple in your office that it's, it's really challenging and hard, um, to give people hope in their relationship. So how did you get into this line of work? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, for me, it's a little unusual, a little different. I, I didn't really get into this because I wanted to necessarily be in the profession. For me, uh, this really came from a very personal place, My wife and I, a long time ago, had our own marital crisis, which was precipitated by, we we had a son who died when he was uh, just a week old. And then about a year and a half later, we had twin daughters who we lost as well. And it was just a really difficult time in our marriage. Um, And we reached out for help in sort of the traditional ways. You know, my wife learned about Mars. I learned about Venus. Um, you know, we went to some professionals and we were kind of horrified with the, the quality uh, of the help that was available and and the methodology that was being offered. In other words, everywhere we went, no matter where we turned, people were asking us what's wrong, you know, and the focus was on our problems and issues. And the argument just went from the, the kitchen table, you know, to their office and we found that the more we talked about what was wrong and the more we focused on the problems, the more we were just stuck in all the negativity of our situation. And we, we walked out of there feeling worse than we did when we, than we went in. And the, the whole, you know, I, I subsequently came to realize that there are just some very fundamental flaws in the whole um, sort of traditional marriage counseling and therapy process. Uh, and we did not find it helpful, and we came to believe that there were these flaws. Long story short, um, rather than focusing on the problems and the issues, we decided to just put them aside temporarily and just try to create goodwill between the two of us, just try to do positive, healthy things that would create a connection. 
And of course, I'm making a very long story short, but it really worked like mint. Hmm. Uh, it was not necessarily, you know, now I'm articulating it as something that's sort of very clear. But at the time, it wasn't like we were doing something deliberate, um, something, you know, the whole, we kind of looked back on what we went through and we felt we had a responsibility to understand how come we succeeded where so many people fail and can we sort of um, create a methodology out of what we did that other people could utilize. And that was really what inspired me to write Marriage Fitness and to create the whole program. Um, and it really was only after looking back on what we did that I was able to sort of, you know, clarify and codify and, and uh, you know, assign language to it. You know, in other words, when we were going through it, we didn't necessarily know what we were doing. Um, the question became, once we got through it, how and why did we succeed when so many people fail? 50% of marriages fail, right? The divorce rate is super high. So... Um, what did you guys, what was like one of the main things that you guys did that in hindsight, you're like, wow, that, that was the turning point for us. So I mentioned it and I can drill down a little further. The, the, um, kind of the, 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 the principle of, for marriage fitness and the program is instead of fixing what's wrong, it's about making new things right. Mm -hmm. In other words, instead of going into the past and dealing with the problems and the issues, which again, just exacerbates the whole negativity of the situation, we moved forward and learned to do new things that created connection and goodwill in our relationship. And what I have subsequently come to realize is that when people are in marital crisis, uh, not just us, but anybody, you tend to identify certain problems and issues that you want to attack, you think they are the problem because they're, they are sort of the symptoms. It's the pain that you're feeling. But in fact, they're not the problem. The real problem in every marital crisis is the lack of connection between a husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And everything else that you would experience as a problem is really a symptom to the real problem, which again is that lack of goodwill, that lack of connection, that lack of love. Um, I'll give you a, you know, a, a sort of my classic example is, you know, traditionally people want to practice these silly communication techniques, but think about it. When you were in love, you could communicate with the wink of an eye and finish each other's sentences, and yet you hardly knew each other. You didn't know the difference between Mars and Venus, and you didn't learn any communication techniques. Now here we are, 10, 20 years later, whatever the case may be, you know each other upside down and inside out. You've learned the difference between Mars and Venus. You've been to counseling and you, you've got all these supposedly successful communication techniques, and you can't say two words to each other without it being, you know, an argument. Mm -hmm. Why is that? So it, it's because, uh, you know, communication is, is, uh, is not the path to love and connection. Love and connection is the path to communication. I agree. I, one of the things that I heard was that couples, it's not that we don't communicate enough, it's that we don't communicate well. And I think that piggybacks off of what you were just saying, the whole creating well-being and I like that phrase because it is a mental shift right like instead of coming in the door and looking at your spouse and initially you know looking to him to like meet my needs right away I when I think of well-being it's like okay that's my job to like create well-being in myself and then pour that out to him is that kind of what it looked like you know just kind of taking that first step to just say okay how am I going to respond to my spouse today or how am I going to create that goodwill in our marriage yeah okay I think yeah uh... I, I was thinking about the term too, marriage crisis, because I think some people listening might think, well, you know, my marriage isn't in crisis, but it's not where I want it to be, or it's not, 
um, good right now? Like, what is your definition of marriage crisis? Because I think there's a spectrum. There's definitely a spectrum. Um, I mean, uh, what's my definition? My definition of marriage crisis is what all of my customers and clients are experiencing. Yeah. <laughs> No, nobody, nobody comes to me in, in, until they're feeling that they're in crisis. The problem is that in most cases, I would say 99% of the case, well, actually, anyway, in most cases, um, before it's so clear that they're in marital crisis, they had a sense, just like you were describing, that things aren't quite the way I want them or ideal, but the pain wasn't excruciating enough that they paid much attention to it. Mm. And so, you know, it's like a physical ailment. Like if you just ignore it, you know, it, it's likely to get worse. And, uh, you know, hopefully this podcast can be a little bit of a wake up call for everybody listening. I mean, of course, if you're in crisis, you don't need a wake up call. Right. But if you're not in crisis, just know that everybody who was, is in crisis wasn't in crisis, you know, last week or last month or last year. They just had, you know, a sort of okay marriage, and they didn't think that there was anything so terrible that they had to deal with. I actually wrote a whole article once about, you know, what's what's going on in your marriage that you don't know about. Um, and, uh, that sounds you know, how, <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of times there are dynamics and uh, going on in a relationship that are really sowing the seeds for a serious crisis and people just don't realize it. Mm -hmm. What are some of those things that you've seen that are those seeds? Of, What's that? What are some of those seeds that you're seeing that are happening in marriages that people aren't really aware of? Um, so one would be, I'll just give you an example. I mean, there's dozens of examples, but I'll give you one. One of the keys to a successful marriage is something I call mutual consent. In other words, in a healthy marriage, we shouldn't make, we don't make decisions unilaterally. The significant decisions in our life, in our marriage, in our family, with our kids, with our career, et cetera, et cetera, are, are made in conjunction with our spouse. We build this life together. We're achieving mutual consent before we move forward with significant matters. Um, but very often in a marriage, you have Two people that are very different, one that has a very make it happen, dominant, courageous kind of personality, and another person who's much more passive, easygoing, people pleasing. And very often what this results in is the person who's more stronger and more dominant, they are unilaterally making decisions um, in their life and in their marriage and regarding their kids and their family and their finances and whatever. Um, and because their spouse is kind of this people pleasing, passive, easygoing kind of person, they're going along with it for a while. And it seems like they're in agreement. It seems like they're saying yes, because they didn't say no. Mm. But in fact, yeah. on the inside, there's this growing resentment that I'm not really a part of this life that we're building. I'm not an equal. Mm. I don't have a say. I don't have input. And you're sort of trampling upon my wishes without even realizing it. This resentment can build and build and build for, for literally years. Uh, and the person who's the more dominant doesn't even realize it because from their perspective, you said yes. From your perspective, you said okay. From their perspective, you didn't put up a fuss. But from the perspective of the person who is easygoing and people pleasing, they didn't speak up because it's not their way. They didn't want to ruffle anybody's feathers, but in fact, they're displeased and they're not, they're not satisfied. And that, and that ends up creating a crisis later when one day the person just says, that's it. I'm done. I'm sick of being trampled upon. Now things are going to be my way. The irony is that very often in that situation, people end up switching roles. The person who was, you know, constantly subjugating themselves to their spouse now says everything is going to be my way and they become very controlling. Mm -hmm. And the person who was controlling without even realizing it says, oh my gosh, this person wants to say I better subjugate myself to them and let them have their way. And I say it's ironic because if the relationship was dysfunctional when one person was weak and the other person too strong, it's just as dysfunctional when they switch roles. That's not what should be 
happening. Mm -hmm. What should be happening is they should learn to achieve mutual consent, which requires both people to be sort of courageous and considerate at the same time, which is really the definition of emotional maturity. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of work. Right. I love that mutual consent. So does that look like checking in, checking in with your spouse and asking them, like, I, I heard you on another podcast say, like, you know, oftentimes we think that the other person should be able to know what we need. And that's not the case, right? They should, we should be able to say what we need. Is that kind of what you're saying here? Um, yes. Well, it's, it's two things. One is you have to have the courage to uh, step up and say in your relationship, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I think. This is how I see it. But at the same time, or in the next breath, you have to have the consideration to say to your spouse, but I care about you. And I expressed my, it, my input, I expressed my view, not because I demand that it become our reality, but because I want to be part of this decision-making process with you. So what do you think? How do you see it? What's your opinion? What's your input? It's very hard. It's, it's, it's much easier to either act unilaterally, just take control, or subjugate yourself to your spouse and say, well, you do what you want. It, both of those are relatively easy. It mm -hmm. takes tremendous maturity to embody both courage and consideration at the same time and to achieve oh, yeah. mutual yeah. consent. I love that. That makes so much sense. The courage and consideration is, oh, that's beautiful. Okay, what would you say to the person listening and they're saying, but you know, I want this and I could do that and I'm willing to put the work in, but my spouse is not. They're checked out or, you know, they're using other ways of coping that aren't okay with me or what would you say to that person? So any other day I might have answered this question differently, but uh, today I have to answer it like this. I just, right before my call with you, I, um, you know, as, as you probably know, I have my own podcast, you know, the Fix Your Marriage yeah. More Detail podcast. And I just interviewed a woman uh, for my podcast. It'll probably be released in a few days, um, who was telling the story of her situation. And I had never spoken to this woman before. So I didn't know what was going to come out. That we were just having a very spontaneous conversation as she was sharing with me, you know, her whole story. And at some point in the story, she started to explain how after she had been employing the principles and practices that I teach in my program for a little while, that her husband started to treat her differently, that he started to be loving and kind and much more giving, and that it really, you know, sort of transformed him. So I said to her, interesting, are you saying that she, he joined you in the program also? She said, no. No, he never joined the program. I was in the Lone Ranger track, which is the aspect of my program for people dealing with an obstinate spouse. The whole time, my husband, I never switched to the duo track. My husband never joined me in the program. And wow. this, is this is typical. Um, people think that it takes two to tango, that I've got to get my spouse to join me in the program in order to make progress in our marriage. And it's not true. There's a, there's a lot that one person can do independent of their, of their spouse that can have a tremendous impact on the marriage and on their spouse's behavior. I mean, think about it. You know, how I treat you is not simply a function of who I am. It's also largely a function of who you are. And um, a lot of times my behavior towards a person is in response to their behavior towards me. And so for people who say, you know, I have a difficult spouse, an obstinate spouse, a stubborn spouse, da, 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 da. I've heard it a million times, you know, and, and usually really what they're saying is I'm the one who's too stubborn to do the work unilaterally without it being a transaction between me and my spouse. I want him or her to do the work too. Mm -hmm. and. I would challenge you on that. Why? I mean, I understand why. Of course, I understand why. 
But I would challenge you on that and just appreciate that if you want to be right, so fine, you can be right. You'll be justified. You know, he's not doing it or she's not doing it, so you're not doing it either. You'll feel justified. But if you want to feel if you want to be effective, then don't worry about feeling justified. Just do the work. And you'll see how your marriage will change and your spouse will change. I mean, a, a relationship is a little bit like a chemistry experiment. If I take chemical A and mix it with chemical B, I get chemical C. If I want to get a different outcome, if I want to create chemical D, I don't need to change both A and B. I could just change one, and the outcome is different. It's the same in a relationship. Um, can you expand a few, a little bit more on some of those secrets that you've developed or discovered to fixing marriages? I know you said the courage and consideration is a huge one. And then secondly, I just heard you say like kind of getting over yourself a little bit and not trying to be right all the time and not, um, you know, doing this work, even if your spouse is checked out because that is effective and it works. Um, are there any other secrets or tools that you can give today um, for fixing your marriage and making it, you know, not only just be okay, but thrive. I feel like people listening to this show really want a life that they want, that they love, that they want to be in. And, and that includes marriage and relationships. So I'll mention something. It's, it's, it's very simple. I feel even, even a little silly mentioning it. Um, I, I hope your audience will feel that it's valuable. I'm not going to tell you anything here you don't know, but what I find is what is common sense is usually not common practice in a marriage. Mm -hmm. To succeed in your marriage requires time. Time together. One-on-one -on -one focused time together. With the phones away, the laptops closed, the kids asleep, out of work, out of the house. Um, remember the kind of time you used to give to each other when you were courting? That's why it, that courtship created such a connection. You want to know why you don't have such a connection anymore? It's probably because you built parallel lives where you know you each sort of divided and conquered in order to tackle the business of running a family. So it could be that everything's in order and the bills are paid and the kids are clothed and the refrigerator is filled. But you know, dividing and conquering uh, accomplishes exactly what it describes. It's divisive. And you know, if you have separate lives, you're going to feel, well, separate. If you want to feel close and connected, it requires time. And so structurally, what does that look like? Well, I'll share with you what it looks like in my marriage and what I recommend to others. Um, first of all, every night my wife and I spend, you know, like 20 to 40 minutes together just hanging out. Again, not with the computers, not with the phones, not with the bills, and not talking about what has to get done. Just being together, hanging out, talking. You know, listening to music. She makes me a smoothie. I love to eat it. Uh, you know, and uh, sometimes it's in the bedroom and sometimes it's in the kitchen, but we're just together. And then once a week, you know, we try to go out and get out of the house and spend a few hours together. And then once a month, we try to get away, um, just the two of us, um, you know, just for a little short trip where we can really immerse uh, in each other and have time to, uh, you know, to be together. And so there's just, you know, to have this sort of, you know, it's like, imagine you were running a business. Uh, you know, it, it, my guess is there would be some structure to the way you invest your time and energy in the business. You'd have certain meetings with certain key people on a daily or weekly or monthly or quarterly or annual basis. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that you run your marriage like a business, but the point is that, you know, it requires time. It's just inescapable. I'll, I'll just give you a parenting analogy. Uh, you know, sometimes parents like to say that, you know, the most important time that I spend with my kids is that it be quality time, Qual you know, the emphasis on quality. 
I think that's a lie. Um, I think kids need a lot of time, a, a lot of time, quantity. I agree. <laughs> and, I agree. And, and the more, qua- of, of course, there has to be an emphasis on quality. Of course, we should focus on that. But we can't use an hour of quality time on a Sunday as an excuse or a substitute for spending a quantity, a significant quantity of time during the week. And the same is true in a marriage. Um, You know, sometimes people tell me about these elaborate anniversary trips, you know. My response is, so what? You know, I mean, it's nice. It's nice if it's in the context of a whole lifestyle where you're consistently spending time together. If it's a once a year thing, forget about it. It'll be it'll be almost meaningless. Mm. I'm so happy you said that because it just makes so much sense to me in the way that you just painted that picture of it's it's a relationship. It's a per, you you treat the relationship when you go to counseling, but it's like we almost need to do that in our lives, um, just as like it's a child, like you pay attention to it and you prioritize it and you can't just expect it to grow and thrive right. if you don't prioritize it. And that's what I hear you saying. Yeah, this, look, that, this is what, this is one of the reasons why I called my program marriage fitness. Cause it's a little bit like, a little bit like physical fitness. Like imagine wanting to be uh-huh. in shape, but not being willing to spend the time to, to exercise. Right. I mean, we and then just going to work out once a year yeah. on your anniversary is not going to make you exactly. have that relationship that you want. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I think I feel like though. I mean, I'm listening and thinking like, hey, how can I apply this to my marriage? Because you know, we have three kids, we have two businesses. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm doing lots of things, and I would eat. I could tell you that this is the most stressful time of our life right now. And Sam and I often look at each other. We just say, like, gosh, this is so hard. Like, and we're so exhausted and that we, we just have a hard time prioritizing time for each other because we're like, well, I'm all right. You're all right. And, but then I notice then after a while, it's like, he misses me. And then I miss having that connection. And so it really is. It's from that. I think losing that like getting off track or what people say, I fell off the wagon, you know, it's like falling off the wagon of taking care of your relationship and just really being with each other and not having those kind of distractions like you were mentioning before. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, Chrissy, my guess is you've never been too busy to fill up the gas tank, right? That's true. (laughs) And and really think about that. I mean, all that we've got going on, I mean, I've got, you've got three kids, I've got five kids and you know, my work. And I mean, everybody's got a busy life, but we all pull into the gas station periodically to fill up. Why? Because we know it's important. And if we don't do it, we're going to get stuck. So it's, it's a really requires a paradigm shift and to realize that this is important. This is a priority. And if you don't do it, you're going to end up getting stuck later. And it's going to end up costing you a lot more time and energy in some marital crisis. Oh, gosh, this is so good. I wish I could just pick your brain for the next hour. But thank you so much for being here. I think this was so encouraging. I I know for me to hear, but also for the listeners just to, you know, know that you don't have to be in a place where your marriage, you you could be on that spectrum, like we said before. Um, and that you can work on your marriage and, and really prioritize it and start shifting that paradigm. Even if you're, like you said, the Lone Ranger, I love that that track, you know, because sometimes it feels like that in marriage. Um, wow. Thank you so much, Mark. Can you tell everybody where they can find you and what you offer um, as additional support for this? Sure. Thank you for asking. You can go to MorkFertel.com. And I offer uh, a free report. It's called Seven Secrets for Fixing Your Marriage. It's totally free. There's no strings attached. And there's some great information there. You can sign up to receive that on my website. And if you want to join the program, it's called the Marriage Fitness Tele Boot Camp. Um, it's the most popular and successful marriage crisis program in the world. And uh, you can get that at uh, mortfertel.com. 
And I also have links on my website to all my social media channels where I put out lots of good marriage help information too. So if you like Twitter or Facebook or podcasts or whatever the case may be, um, you can find links on my website. All right. Thank you again so much, Mort. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and for, I appreciate your great questions. Awesome. Well, we'll have to have you back on soon. <laughs> Look forward to it. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. Really, really hope that that um, kind of impacted you and, and hit home where you're at in your relationships and gave you maybe some more tools for your toolbox. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you again just for being such loyal listeners. Um, we would really appreciate and love your positive reviews and feedback. You can leave them anywhere that you're listening, um, on iTunes especially. Totally helps us get the word out. And if you feel like this episode would be good for someone else, please consider texting it to them and reaching out to us. Uh, let me know on Instagram at Chrissy J Powers where you're listening, tuning in from, and what is resonating with you. I love to share those on my Instagram. So thank you again so much for being here, you guys. I'm sending out so much grace and gratitude to you right now.